Hello, and welcome to Follow Your Curiosity, where we explore the ups and downs of the creative process and how to keep it moving. I'm your host, Nancy Norbeck. I am a writer, singer, improv comedy newbie, science fiction geek, and creativity coach who loves helping right-brained folks get unstuck. I am so excited to be coming to you with interviews and coaching calls to show you the depth and breadth both of creative pursuits and creative people, to give you some insight into their experiences, and to inspire you. What happens when three children grow up in a very artistic household? When I talked to Todd Evans, a poet from Trenton, New Jersey, earlier this year, I didn't realize I was going to have the chance to find out. Todd's father was playwright Don Evans, and their mother was a lyric soprano. His sister, Rachel Mariano, is also a poet, and his brother is Oren Evans of the Grammy-nominated Captain Black Big Band. I'll be talking to all three of them over the next three episodes. Todd has started several poetry open mics and is the founder of the Don Evans Players. We talk about what inspired him to start that group, how art came back to him after a period of addiction, and how his parents influenced him as a child and never lost their faith in him. He also graces us with a beautiful brand new poem. Here's my conversation with Todd Evans. Todd, thanks so much for being here today. Thank you. I'm curious to know, because I know you, your father was a playwright, and I'm very curious to know how that influenced you as a kid. What was that like for you? Oh, it was great. Um, I grew up in the theater. He was also a director. And he had his uh, a community, couple community theater groups, and he did some things professionally. And I got to be there and watch uh, in some of the stuff. Uh, he even uh, was pretty cool with discussing some of his plays and other people's plays when I was very young. So I got a pretty good understanding of the theater and performing arts and creative arts in general. So how did that how did that influence what you ended up doing? Did you start writing your own things when you were pretty small or was that a, a thing you started doing later? No, I was writing when I was very little. My mother uh, encouraged me a lot with my poetry and my writing. Um, I won a couple contests and I, I was active in my dad's junior players theater group. And um, but I got away from it as I got older. I got involved in sports and, and I had a, a lot of fun. And later on, I had a successful co coaching career. I drifted away from the arts um, mainly because I got into a world that consumed everything, which was uh, addiction and streets and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, I stayed in that for so long uh, that it it ate up, if that's the right word, my desire to do anything else. Um, in coming out of that as a, an older person, um, I relit the fire for my love for creative arts. And um, I kind of use it as a way to give back what I kind of stole mm -hmm. uh, from the community. Yeah, I remember the first time I met you, you were sitting on the sidewalk outside Classics in Trenton. And I think you what you were doing, you called, correct me if I'm wrong, but it was something like Poetry Jukebox. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow, you got a good memory. <laughs> yeah, you sure, I sure, it sure did do that. Um, yeah, Eric and I have come up with some real creative stuff <laughs> to do down at Classics, but... Um, I'm thankful for him because he's a, a pretty flexible guy when it comes to ideas. He is. He's great. So, And the poetry jukebox was that in exchange for a donation, you would offer up a poem on the subject of the donor's choice. Is that right? Y yes, yes. Yes. Which was a lot and of fun. It was fun. Um, I'm not as good as, it, as I'd like to be. Um, I, I met a gentleman, I forget his name, wow, that does that type of thing. He, he'll... You give him your idea, give him a couple of minutes, and he actually types up the poem on a on an old school typewriter. Oh wow! Um, but um, I, I did pretty good that day, thanks to guys like you supporting it, not thinking I was crazy. <laughs> no, I didn't think it was crazy at all. I thought it was great. And then the proceeds went like to an organization, if I'm remembering right, which just 
it was like, you know, everybody wins. It was great. Yes. Yeah, it was um, helping out with, the, I believe, the basketball league in the park. So do you do things like that often? Yes, we um, have found ways to use some of my open mic and events to support some other things in the community. We raised money for uh, a guy who was like a mentor for me in Camden County. Mm -hmm. He had a severe stroke and we um, raised money to help with his family. We've raised money for kids that are trying to do uh, sports or creative endeavors. So um, I'm pretty proud of that fact. Yeah, you should be. So do you ever end up managing to get any of those kids involved in writing poetry, acting, anything like that? Or does it not cross over? A few of them um, are actually uh, artists themselves or members of some things that uh, I do. A young lady named uh, Tatiana, who's a dancer, a very talented dancer. Uh, We've helped her raise some money for some of her competitions. Uh, we, a fellow by the name of James Graham, who's also a poet and I guess you'd call poetry active activist in the Trenton area. Mm-hmm. We did a youth poetry slam and um, we got to give out a prize to a young Trenton poet uh, where she got a limo ride and uh, tickets to a dinner and a poetry show. So, um, yeah, we have been able to reward some of the young people in the arts. I'm, I'm loving the image of a poetry contest involving a limo ride. That's just so not what you would expect. I think that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah it was pretty different. <laughs> well, that's awesome. So how did, how did you start doing all of the open mic stuff? Because I know that's a big part of what you do. Well, um, in um, some rehabilitation uh work I was doing, um, I started writing again at Mm -hmm. the urgings of some counselors. And um, it started pouring out. A lot of Mm -hmm. it was about the horrors of addictions and other things, but eventually it branched out into some other things and I needed an outlet for it. Um, I called a a brother by the name of Brother uh, Daoud Bay in Camden County. And he uh, told me about his open mic with a lady by the name of Sandra Turner Barnes. And I started attending there and falling in love with the arts again. And um, they told me some other places to go. Uh, I went to an open mic run by a lady by the name of Barbara Brenner um, and a lady named Linda D. Federici noticed some of my work and gave me my first feature. And I was on cloud nine. (laughs) Then I got another feature by Brother Bay. And I decided maybe I could start one in my own area, which was Willemboro. Mm -hmm. Even though I'm a Trenton resident, and I was a Trenton born and raised in that area. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I went to the rec center where I had coached at for so many years and brought the idea there. And that's how the Willemboro Open Mic started uh, almost nine years ago. Uh, I got involved with Eric and the event in Trenton about seven years ago because um, he was promoting a book of mine. And he had an open mic that went down and he was trying to get it back up. Mm -hmm. He talked with me and um, we've been running ever since. So how many people do you usually get for an open mic? It can go from one to 50, (laughs) you know. Um, Classics is kind of small, so um, 15 feels like 50. Mm -hmm. Uh, The Willember Open Mic, I have more space, and um, we just had an uh, anniversary event two weeks ago where it was maybe 60 to 65 people there. So, you know, we, we... we get them. It comes and it goes. Classics has more of a following. There's like a family mm-hmm. uh, environment where you know we have a lot of the same artists who um, take care of the event just as much as I do. Right. And for people who aren't familiar with Classics, it's this fabulous little used bookstore in Trenton. It's not very big. I'd say it's probably. 
I don't know, maybe slightly bigger than most people's living room. And it's packed with books. So when we say 15 people in there feels like 50, we're not kidding. And it, the, the guy who owns it, Eric Maywar, does a great job of supporting local authors and local artists. And it's just this great little cultural hub where you would not expect it right in the middle of downtown Trenton. To show how much he supports it, he actually got some um, supporters of the bookshop to make the uh, shelves so that they have wheels on them so that we can move them to make more room for the open mic. And um, that's just one of the reasons why I always keep it going, because um, he cares that much about the community to Mm -hmm. do that. So um, we crowd in there, but we have such a good time that nobody (laughs) complains. Do you get... When you say you get 15 people at Classics, is that 15 people who participate or does that include people who just want to listen? We get a mixture of both. um, And I found out that after a while, some of those who just want to listen also become participants after a while. Some of them. And there are a few who just want to listen. Mm -hmm. So do any of the people who eventually become participants come to you and say, how do I do this? You know, help me out here because I think this is great. Oh, yes, there's um, so many events that have, uh, in one way or another, come out of um, the Willenboro Open Mic or Classics Open Mic or some other events that I've had. I also do one for the Trenton African American Cultural Collaborative at the Sanctuary in Ewing Township. And Mm -hmm. um, we get people there. I've known quite a few people that have started their own events that were inspired by mine like I was inspired by other people and I try to support or guide them just like I was. The funny thing about mine is when um, there's a real competitive edge in the uh, poetry open mic world which I kind of dislike because it kind of holds some of us back because we're so busy competing with each other that we don't help each other. Mm, But when I started my open mic, uh, Brother Bay, all the people who inspired me and had their own were nothing but supportive Mm -hmm. of mine. So I try to be as supportive as I can of others. So what does that usually look like? What's what's the most common thing that people need? Um, One, just a sense of unity. Um, If my event is on Friday and yours is on Saturday, there's nothing wrong with me announcing yours on Saturday. Mm -hmm. If we're on the same day and I can announce it, I I, I will. Uh, If I can get there, I try to get there. Uh, There's many of us who uh, uh, sometimes, per se, grow out of uh, an event, but tend to forget where we grew from. Mm, Yes. That kind of hurts the culture, I, I, I think. Um, take the Willenboro Open Mic. There's so many performers and so on that have launched into their own event. We had a young man who passed away whose first time performing ever before the public uh, was there. And he went on, his name was Justin Graham, and he went on to be a finalist at the Apollo. And one wow. thing I can say about Justin is that whenever he could, he made it back to the Willenboro Open Mic. Um, mm-hmm. That was his starting point. A young man, a comedian by the name of Kells Barksdale, he moved to California and now he's performing in California and Hollywood. And he started out with us, mm-hmm. but he's quick to mention where he started out from. No, that's great. And, I, you know, it's interesting because I, I, I'm glad you mentioned the competitive element because I don't think people realize how easy it is to fall into that trap. And it's not you know, it's not that everybody has to be better or your event has to be bigger. It's just that everybody should be out doing their thing, regardless of what that looks like. And the more you can make a community out of it, the better I think it goes for everyone. So supporting another artist is, is supporting yourself if you're an artist. And uh, sometimes people forget that. Um, my, like myself, when James Graham, who has an event called Trenton Divine Poetry Night Out, which is a pretty big event. But um, one of the reasons why we came together to collaborate was um, because we wanted to show that unity that we could work together. Mm -hmm. And it was a blessing to me, you know. 
opened up some doors for me, opened up some doors for him at, at the same time. And that's another interesting thing, the idea that of doors opening. I mean, there's there's a degree of providence in that, I think. You know, yes, if, so how how has that helped with what you're doing? The, you know, chance meetings and occurrences that that may have guided your path? Well, uh, like take um, James. I met James. I did some work with him. And then somebody who's a friend of his that doesn't work with him, a uh, brother by the name of King Science Justice, uh, he does some events and he called me to do a gig. So it got my name around and I was able to get something out of it while we were doing something for others. So um, it, it kind of, it's like a win-win. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think we just, we forget that win-win can actually happen. Yeah, yeah. It's a, <laughs> and it's not hard. Yeah, clearly not. <laughs> That's the part that, um, now, if you happen to hear a crash or a boom, it's because my grandchildren are running around while we're doing this. <laughs> just, that's just FYI that's okay. in case. That's all right. So when you talk about how you, you rediscovered your love for the arts, what was that like for you, especially, you know, coming out of that dark period? Freaky. Um, <laughs> when I say that is because my parents always believed it. I, I thought that they were crazy. You know, I, um, there's a story I always tell. I won't go too much into it because I always tell it, but where we my haven't father, heard it. It's okay. <laughs> uh, my father was telling me about how to direct one of his plays at a time when I was the furthest away from doing anything like that. Mm-hmm. And he was adamant on how to do it and, you know, this, this, and that. And at the time, I was sitting in a jail cell and I thought he was nuts. And I said, dad, why are you telling me this? And mm-hmm. he said, cause one day you're going to be doing this. And I was like, does it look like I'm going to be doing this? He said, no, <laughs> no, but you'll get it together and you will be doing this. 20 something years later, I was directing that same play. Mm-hmm. And I had forgotten about that conversation and that situation. And, uh, that scene came up that he told me about and I knew exactly what to do. And someone who knew my father back in the day and knew the play was said, you know, how did you know that? I said, I don't know. And it wasn't until later on, I recall that my father had somehow in his parental wisdom or some other hocus pocus thing saw me doing. (laughs) And, um, you know, that's then, and that's real. That's actually what happened. My mother, I can remember my mother telling me that I was a poet and that I would write and that I would do this and that. And I was like, I had no idea what she was talking about. So sometimes that stuff that your parents see in you um, might be beyond you, but it, it could also be true. So did she start telling you that when you were really young or was that later on or was it the whole time? The whole time. Um <laughs> I can remember, uh, again, calling from a, a jail cell, calling from a county jail trying to get out. And um, the phone call conversation said, this is from inmates, something, something, something. And um, my mother said uh, she she received the call, but she wasn't receiving the declaration. She said, you're not an inmate, you're a poet, and you're going to do this, and you're going to do that. And I was like, yeah, mom. Right now, I'm an inmate. I need bail. <laughs> and, <laughs> but, you know, she was, you know, never received it. And uh, I thank God for that. That's great. I mean, because I think from other people that I've talked to, it makes such a huge difference when your parents are the, the parents who say, you're a poet, you're a musician, we're going to take you for lessons, even if it means we have to drive you an hour each way every week. We're, you know, we're, we're mm-hmm. in your corner, we're going to help you out. Is that... Is that your experience too? Yes, that was my experience, especially with my father. My mother um, was, she was like that with anything. Um, When I drifted to sports, she didn't accept that as much. Mm -hmm. Eventually she did, but she still was, um, would not let me 
put uh, I would put poems and stories in a, in a drawer for nobody to see. Mm-hmm. And my mother would not do that. Um, matter of fact, on as my mother when my mother died. Uh, days later, we found one of my stories next to her bed that she was reading at night before she went oh, to bed. Oh, wow. And that uh, blew my mind. I'll I was bet. happy, though, because it was a book I'd actually published and I wanted her to, to read. And uh, it was my goal to get something published before she passed away. Mm-hmm. And um, that did happen. So I, I thank God for that. Wow. And it, what about brothers, sisters? Were they, it, was it the same thing with them? If you have brothers and sisters? Well, my brother is a world famous jazz musician. He's all over the world uh, by the name of Warren Evans and he's been Grammy nominated and all that. And um, my first, uh, well, I say new Todd poem was a poem that I wrote and sent to him and he, uh, turned it into a song and published it on an album. And uh, he had did a, a production on the radio, WDAS-FM, with the great Sonia Sanchez. And he asked me to write a piece for that about John Coltrane, which I did. But uh, he wanted me to come read it on the radio, and I was, to be honest, I was afraid. Mm-hmm. At that time, I had I said, there's no way, and you know, I'm I'm not coming on the air and reading no poem, especially with <laughs> Sonia Sanchez. <laughs> and um, the great Sonia Sanchez read my poem, and I got a call from my brother, and he said somebody wants to talk to you, and it was Miss Sanchez, and she said, "Son, I love this poem. Would you allow me to read it on the radio?" Mm-hmm. And um, I almost passed out. <laughs> but I said, sure, if you want to. And she read my poem on the radio, and that gave me a push that, you know, maybe I was halfway good at this. So, um, and I, I it, it, you know, gave me a push to go a little bit further. Um, the great part of it is that I, uh, this was several years ago, mm-hmm. and I never got to thank her. And um, there was an event at Princeton University a year ago, and she was one of the poets there. And um, I had this dream that I would be able to see her, um, but I didn't know how to do it. And Princeton University called me about bringing some people from Trenton to the event. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly, I was like amazing how it worked out. So I was like, wow, this will give me a chance to um, maybe run into her and thank her. Right. And... um, as a reward, I guess, for getting some people together, they also allowed me to go to some poetry conferences with all these great worldwide spoken word and poet mm-hmm. poets. And one of them was Sonia Sanchez. And um, um, I was telling my wife, I'm going to meet her. I'm going to be able to say thank you. And uh, my wife said, you know, that'll be great. And I go up, go outside. I don't know what I was going to do. And she walks right past me, coming in. Mm-hmm. And I froze. I, was, I, I said nothing. I went back to my seat and I was so mad. Yeah. And um, her son is like her manager or so on. Mm-hmm. Uh, as I'm going back, he walked by me too. I knew who he was and I, I got the courage. I said, look, man, um, can you deliver a message for me? I, you know, I don't know if your mother remembers, but so on and so on. He said, go tell her yourself. And I went over and I told her and, oh man, uh, she looked back and she started thinking and obviously she remembered mm-hmm. and she said just keep writing and um but a load was lifted on my shoulder off my shoulder oh sure I, that's and, fantastic uh, and to finish this long answer i'm giving you to this okay. question my sister is also a poet in her own right she's an educator but she's an amazing poet and um she uh her love for the art is kind of fuel for my love for the art. Wow, that is quite the artistic household you grew up in. Yeah, it, it definitely was. It um, it was amazing to see. My mother was a singer, my father a director and producer and all that stuff. So I, I saw and met a whole lot of great people. I have a book somewhere, which I need to find, 
that Nikki Giovanni signs for me as a maybe 10 year old poet telling me to keep writing. Wow. Um, yeah, I, I got to sit down recently in Trenton and um, talk to and get some mentorship from Yusef Komanyaka, who knew my father. Mm-hmm. So I, I've been blessed from that artistic family thing, I guess. Absolutely. You were steeped in it. Just plain steeped in it. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there were, I, I have this, this image of this household where it just never stops now in my head. It's great. So going back to rediscovering how, you know, loving art, was it sounds like it was a surprise to you, was it? Had you just so completely forgotten what that world was like? It was a surprise that I could still do it. Okay. It was also uh, a disappointment in because I was much like some young men that I had coached who were great on the street court, mm-hmm. but not good on the field. Because I had uh, pretty much blown my education at it at that time, um, there's still some things that I need now, which I'm in the process of getting, you know, um, some uh, education on the art. Mm-hmm. Things I am things I do as a writer are just things that I've been blessed to be able to do. But, uh, t- for example, when I first started, I thought a haiku was somebody sneezing, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and um, But I learned from, you know, one thing that I w- have been blessed uh, is that a whole bunch of uh, established poets and spoken word artists took a liking to me and took me under their wing. And if I had a question, I could ask them. And um, it, 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 that part has been great. But I, I do need to get more education in the art of poetry. Mm-hmm. Did you find once you started writing poetry again that it just sort of came out of nowhere? Or did you really have to work at it to get it back? No, it kind of just flowed out of me almost. Um, oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> it's really, really, really weird. I just thank God that my, my wife saw it too. Um, my dad would always, pre- not pressure, but push me to write because um, mm-hmm. he knew that I could do it. And I would give him ideas and he would take him. He said, yeah, but you better write it. Write it down. Write it down. And I wouldn't write. He gave me a processor, word processor, I guess it was back in the day. And just to write with and mm-hmm. um, I did nothing. With it. And he came and he got so mad, he took it back. <laughs> but then he gave it back to me. And um, after he passed away, this is the weirdest thing, but it's it's the truth. Something came up on my computer that would not go away. And it was uh, a, a, a statement that he told me about writing. And um, I would see it. I, once I would punch into my file where I would store my um, poems and stories at, it would not go away. My wife tried to delete it. I tried to get it, but it wouldn't go away. Once I started writing and reading what I was writing and, you know, being a little more active with it, mm-hmm. eventually it went away. Wow. Now, that may be the craziest thing some people have ever heard, but it's, it's the God's honest truth. What did it say? Um, something about uh, never giving up. This is about 10 years ago, but it was something about never giving up um, on my writing, pretty much. Okay. And um, it was a dedication that I had wrote to him that he wrote back to me about writing. And um, I guess it was like fuel to keep me doing it. Wow. That's, that's very, a fabulous very story. Strange, but... You know, I... It was... I believe it. <laughs> I think. Yeah, it was. I, I mean, it freaked me out. I was like, <laughs> I was my wife, I'm like, here goes that thing again. And um, I couldn't get it, to, you know, to get it out of the way. Um, but when I started writing, eventually it, I, I, I didn't see it anymore. So it was either something subconsciously I did or it was the way of uh, the ancestors speaking back to me. I, I, I have no idea, but it was one of the things that. Yeah, whatever it was, somebody was trying to tell you something. Yes. Yeah. So 
how did you come to, I, I think you founded the Don Evans Players, is that right? Yes. How did my, that happen? My sister, it was my sister, uh, myself, and some members of my father's original uh, Trenton Company, uh, Alma Day, uh, Frank Bridgewater, he's an artist from Trenton that mm -hmm. helped me to do it, uh, an esteemed poet and educator, Doc Long from Trenton, they, they kind of got behind me, but um, it was, again, discussed with my wife and I. Uh, it was during the time of the popularity of the Tyler Perry plays and mm -hmm. the idea things, and they were really great and funny. But in watching some of them, I was like, you know, I remember a different kind of theater. I remember mm -hmm. Lorraine Hansberry. I remember, you know, Fences and so on. And literally, because I had met some of them people in my lifetime or you know, you know, saw my father working with a Debbie Allen and so on. So I knew a different kind of theater that was a little bit different than what I was seeing. And I would constantly uh, bring that up, kind of um, wrecking the vibe of my other family members that were enjoying what they were seeing. <laughs> so <laughs> my wife said to me, she said, well, why don't you show people what you're talking about? Mm -hmm. And... Um, that kind of inspired me, you know, maybe I'll do it. So um, uh, I went to the center where I was doing open mic at and asked them about starting a community theater group. And that's what we did. I think our first production was a reading of one of my father's plays. And then we did a version of Raising in the Sun. And uh, eventually we did some other things. We've done some poetic the theatrical things. And it's, it's been pretty fun. Well, the, prefer, the performance I came to about a year ago seemed like you have a really, really good group of core folks, including among your audience. Does that sound like I've read the room right? Oh, yeah, you're, you're right. They, um, they are amazing people. Uh, the one thing about our group is we have professionals uh, who give their time that, you know, that are actually film actors and so on. Um, uh, Mr. Kyle Moore, uh, Blaze Murray. And we also have people who are just one of the mill everyday people who like performing. Mm -hmm. So we kind of mixed all them together and um, it just worked out. I remember for Racing in the Sun, there was a, uh, there's a white character in the play that I could not find. Mm -hmm. And, um, I found a, an old elderly gentleman who um, I had no idea he had theater experience. Um, but we started talking. I asked him, you know, I just brought it up to, you know, do you think you could play this part for me? And he came and played the part and found out, I found out that he had theater in his blood all the way back to the beginning. And he had also worked with my father that neither one of us knew. Wow. So, yeah, it was great. And, uh, you know. <laughs> So we have a, a theater company now, which has kids in it, has adults. I have to do some things as far as uh, getting help with grant writing and stuff like that, because mm -hmm. we've existed on our own means for quite some time, but it's time to move on and um, I have to get better with that. So how has, how has directing and well informing this company influenced your own work? Well, as a playwright, um, I kind of suck. <laughs> I'm just going to be honest. I'm good at directing. I'm good at writing stories. I'm good at poetry. I don't have the patience for playwriting. Uh, and that's crazy because my dad was such a great one. But um, I have been able to uh, create skits and so on. And um, directing, I kind of, um, I was scared at first. Uh, my sister was really good at it. And she directed most of our plays in the beginning, um, but she kept telling me that I could do it. And um, eventually I've gotten a knack for it, and um, mm -hmm. I'm not afraid of direct directing anymore. Playwriting, I don't think that's going to happen for me as, as much as I would like it to be. I just don't have the patience that I think it takes. But um, all the other elements, I'm, I'm, I can act a little bit, I can direct a little bit, so I'm, I'm proud of that. Has it influenced your poetry? Yes, because I find a way. I found a way to um, combine them both. Uh, 
a lot of my productions with the Don Evan players have prose, uh, poetry, theater. Um, I was able to introduce some young people to Shakespeare and at the same time introduce them to other productions that they may have. I did a, a scene from Fences with teenagers mm-hmm. and, uh, and we also did a scene from Othello and they took to it so great. It was, it was amazing. That's fantastic. Cause you know, kids get so scared of Shakespeare. Do you yes. have a well, way that you, you know, demystify it for them? Well, that's how my father actually got into playwriting. He was uh, teaching to uh, a primarily uh, African-American audience, young African-American audience, and trying to get them to digest Shakespeare. But they were it was hard at first because mm-hmm. of the language barrier and so on. So he adapted some plays. Uh, he took Taming of the Shrew and made a play called Showdown Time. And ex- it kind of uh, explained what Shakespeare was saying in Taming of the Shrew. Mm-hmm. So um, I, it, 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 there was a pop, uh, scene from Desdemona, I believe, uh, proclaiming her love for Othello. And um, this young girl, I think she was 14 or 13 at the time, her name is Katie Cunningham. And uh, cutting him, and um, I tried to break it down in our vernacular today, which made her understand it. But she performed it in the Shakespearean vernacular. She looked up some YouTube things and studied mm-hmm. it, and oh my gosh, she was brilliant. And um, I think she has some stuff on YouTube doing. It. She also did. Uh, the wife's response in Fences, if you're familiar with it, when she found out that her husband was uh, involved in a relationship that uh, brought forth an illegitimate child. And she brought that home at 13 years old. It was amazing. To wow. See. Sounds like you turned her into a real Shakespeare fan at the same time. Yes, yeah, she, she had some initiative, though, because I was scared to try to show her that. Because sometimes when you show, like... Um, the first time I did Raising in the Sun, people were watching, uh, people in the cast were watching the, the actual TV, uh, the movie version. Mm-hmm. And, and it was taken away from a little bit because they were trying too much to be like the movie. Yeah. But she took it, she took what she saw and put herself into it and came out amazing. So what did you do to break through that? This is what I saw in the movie. Therefore, this is what I have to do idea. Um, with the Raising and Suncast, mm-hmm. I just told them don't watch the movie. <laughs> Once I could see them doing things that I know they got from the movie, I, I was like, you know, we want to do our production of it, not somebody else's. Mm-hmm. And that's eventually what we delivered. With uh, young Katie, she took the initiative to watch it on her own, but she had enough uh, sense of her own to to put her own to put her own perspective on. It. I can't take any credit for that. I was just amazed to see it. Yeah, I think once once you've seen what somebody else has done, it can be really hard to break through that and do your own thing with it. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. Yeah. So in directing your father's place, has it given you any new understanding of who he was or how he thought about writing? Craziest thing about that is... Um, my father and I were so tight. Um, it kind of went beyond uh, father and son. We were friends. Mm-hmm. Um, and for some reason, as grow- growing up as a child, he would tell me about his plays. Um, or when he was working on them, he worked in his attic. He remodeled the attic and made that his writing room. Mm-hmm. And he'd be writing a play and he'd call me up and he said, look, listen to this scene. And I would listen to it or, and he would tell me things. So when it comes to my father's work, I pretty much know um, exactly what he was trying to say or how he was trying to say it. Um, and that also gave me a perspective on some other playwrights work. My father made me, he didn't necessarily made me, but he guided me to watch Shakespeare, um, Faustus, you know, all different kind of things. And uh, 
he also introduced me to the black theater greats. So I had a, a knowledge of it um, that I can use today, especially with his work. I, I'm, you know, sometimes when you're trying to de uh, decipher or present somebody else's work, you, you know, it's hard to get a feel. Like, I, I did not know Lorraine Hansberry, so I only mm -hmm. know what what she wrote down with Raising the Sun, but I, I, I'm, I knew my father and I knew what his work was about. So I can uh, really put a, uh, his twist on it. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that it's more difficult to direct someone else's work like Lorraine Hansberry or is there an element of I can just do whatever I want with this? No, because um, I learned from my father also how to respect someone else's work. So um, whereas in my father's, some of my, my father's plays were written, mo the majority of them in the 70s. Mm -hmm. So uh, one play that I did, I changed some of the lingo and language uh, because I could do that because the family has rights to his work. Mm -hmm. And also I knew what he was trying to convey with... Uh, um, Take a Lorraine Hansberry's work, I would never do that. Right. Uh, William Shakespeare's work, I would never do that. Um, but I, I, I um, have a love for the arts and theater where I, I can, um, I get a feel for s certain things that I can and cannot do. That makes sense. Yeah. So I so hope so because it, it didn't sound like. <laughs> <it>. <laughs> But well, it I, sounds like, you know, with, I, with your father's work, you were just updating it because the 70s are not current anymore and mm -hmm. making it a little bit more relevant for now so that people aren't sitting there going, boy, what does that term mean? Or, wow, that's old. I haven't heard it in a while. Which, the other you thing, know. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, 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 go ahead. I'm blessed to have is that in some way or another, either actually in the theater group I have now or people affiliated with it, I have people in my life that worked with my father that mm -hmm. were in his plays, people that played the parts that I'm actually doing. So I, I get a feedback and a, a perspective that is original. They know because they were there mm -hmm. as adults. So that, that really helps me. Um, I did one play, one of my favorites by my dad, a, a play by called a love song for Miss Lydia, where people, that were in it were some of the people that were in the original production. Mm -hmm. So that helped me. Sometimes it, 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 it uh, because they're so loyal to my father, you know, some of them, if I change some stuff, they, your father didn't do that, <laughs> you know, and I explain to them why, or mm -hmm. they'll explain to me why he did what he did. So it's a big help. That's, that's such such a thing that you know most people don't have that yes. you know most people are more or less flying blind by comparison yes so it must be i don't know sort of like having having him talk to you through them to say this is what was going on it must True. be a really interesting feeling sure so was there a piece of advice that he gave you in particular beyond don't stop writing that you found really, really useful? Um, with all your, inter as a director, with all your interpretations and with your uh, feelings and vibes, you also have to uh, let the play speak for itself. And um, that was one big lesson that I got from my father. Uh, the play that I was just talking about, Miss Lydia, has kind of like a open ending um, where you, you're not, there's some money that's missing at the end in the mm -hmm. play. And the main character, you don't know if he took it or not. And my father leaves it like that. Mm -hmm. And as a young man, I said, well, dad, what, what actually happened? And my father said, I don't know. That's for the audience to uh, decide. And you make sure you leave that for them to decide. And he would never tell me. And I honestly I believe that he didn't know. He wrote the play, but uh, it, it really was an open-ended mm -hmm. ending play. It sounds like he just knew that's that's where it was done. Yes. Yeah. That's 
That's cool. I think knowing where things are finished is sometimes one of the hardest things to figure out when you're doing any kind of art. You know, it's so easy to overdo it and tie everything up into a nice little bow at the end when that might not be the best thing to do with it. Yes. And that is exactly what um, I was kind of uh, responding to in the generation, the plays of my current generation, that everything was always tied up in a neat little Mm. bow at the end. And life is not like that. And theater, most of the time, is a reflection of life. We would hope so, one way or another, even if it's completely fantastic. Yes. It should still, yeah, it should still reflect reality somehow. So what would you say to someone who has wanted to write poetry or direct a play or do any other kind of art form, but is feeling a little nervous and skeptical and not really sure if they're good enough or how to start? What would you tell them? Um, I I, I hear it all the time. And um, the only thing I can tell them is what was told to me is right. Um, How many times I hear people call me or come up to me, I want to write a book and I want to write a play or I want to do this. And and, uh, first question I ask them is what people ask me, well, you know, how's it coming? And they haven't written a page up. Mm -hmm. Um, The first thing to do is to get it out. You know, they'll say, well, I'm not unsure about this. I'll write it down, start working on it, and it will push you to finish it. The only way you'll know is if you start doing something. And um, I, I meet a lot of people who have the idea but not the action. I try to promote and provoke some of the action. Sometimes I work and sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> yeah, I think it's fear of the blank page. You know, the or, or or maybe the blank page is more comforting than the idea that what you put on the blank page might not be good enough. Yes, it's a, it's a challenge, but one that you'll never know unless you do it. And also uh, listening to the ones that you go to. Um, the, again, I mentioned earlier, uh, educator and poet from the Trenton area by the name of Doc Long. And I will never forget as I was doing starting some of the things that I was starting, he would always put some kind of bug in my ear about something. And um, he was telling me, this is so crazy. He was telling me about the play Fences and um, uh, um, Mr. August Wilson. And he was friends with my father, Mr. Doc Long and so on. And he stopped me one day and he said, do you know that your father knew August Wilson? And I was like, I- I've heard they were friends. And he said, have you read Fences? And I was like, well, not really. You know, he said, you can't do what you're doing, son, unless you read Fences. <laughs> and I heard him and time went on and I still hadn't reread Fences. And um, I saw him again. And he said, you know, how's Fences coming along? And I'm like, uh, I haven't done it. <laughs> um, so one, the next time I saw him in the streets in front of Classics after open mic, and he was like, you need to read Fences. I read Fences, and a couple of days later, this is crazy, a uh, gentleman who runs Boyd Academy, a, a youth organization, called me and asked me would I um, take a job dis- deciphering Fences to youth and doing a youth reading production with them. <laughs> and I was able to say yes because I had read Because you had read it. Yes, and because I listened to finally what a mentor was telling me. Uh, mm-hmm. I notice nowadays that people will ask for advice and then don't take it. And that's yeah, kind of crazy. It's true. I think people are just too scared to actually jump in and, and do the things that they want to do, which is a but feeling that, I can relate to. But yeah. Then there are those that I see, you know, that take it and run with it. I, mm-hmm. I'm a lady by the name of Tamika Samoran sent me a, a, a manuscript on like a Monday that she was going to idea that she was going to write. And I said, this is cool. You know, go ahead and write. Within a week, she had written it. Uh, maybe a couple of weeks later, published it and was on tour with it. And, um, you know, she was so appreciative, you know, saying I lit a fire, but she really had the fire on her mm-hmm. own. 
Yeah, she just needed somebody to strike the match. Yeah, I guess so. And, you know, she did it. It's interesting to think about what what makes that difference. I think some people just need a nudge and other people have so much resistance. And I say this without judgment because I can relate to a lot of it. And I know it's a natural part of the process a lot of the time where we wouldn't have creativity coaches and people like Stephen Pressfield who write books all about it. But yeah. but yeah, it's it's just cracking through that that resistance and even you know you were talking earlier about how long it took to think oh hey maybe I can actually do this you know it's it it's a process it takes a while but you'll never find out if you don't keep plugging at it you're absolutely right yeah so I'm wondering if you might be able to close us out with a poem close us out with a poem Yes, I can close you, close us out with a poem. Matter of fact, um, I'm I'm gonna do one that um, I will do one that I wrote about a half an hour ago. If okay, you don't mind. great. Um, I'm gonna pull it up on my phone because I just wrote it down. Look, I'm kind of a spoken word artist slash poet, where some I do write from memory, and other ones I read, mm-hmm. and I love both. Uh, neither one stands out more to me. Um, This poem I have to read because I just wrote it. (laughs) It's a poem about um, the great Malcolm X. And um, I will read it in one minute as I pull it up on my phone. I'm kind of glad because I want to see what it sounds like. (laughs) If that's okay. Your test audience is great. And it's called um, Malcolm Had a Dream. And this is it. Malcolm Had a Dream. Yes, he did too. And it was for me and for you. And it was just as courageous as Martin's was eloquent. One of plain old common sense, the truth, the no nonsense. And much like Martin, some of them killed him for it. Malcolm had a dream that was beautiful and powerful, but whether we black people like it or not, some of us killed him for it. And as we kill our dreamers, we kill our dreams and turn them into nightmares, which kill us, which choke us. Supporting dreams can help them come true. Supporting nightmares help them come true as well, screaming to make us great again while only making us hate again. This is what happens to dreams, not just deferred, but killed. They simply die, and us with them. For Malcolm, who also had a dream. Wow. Thank Thank you, all. Oh, thank you. I feel like that applies in so many levels, including a lot of what we've just been talking about, but obviously way beyond that, too. Yeah, it it, it, it surely does. It does. I, I was watching the TV show. Um, that uh, it's called The Godfather of Harlem, and it was talking to, talks about uh, a gangster in Harlem, but it also talks about some of the people that were around him. And Malcolm X was one uh, a person who knew him. And um, in reflecting on watching, I was like, wow, dude. you know, he didn't have the speech, but he also had a dream, much mm-hmm. like the other gentleman. And it also talks about Kennedy and how he was killed. And I was like, notice how we treat yes. our dreamers and what we get from treating our dreamers in this way. Some of our nightmares come true. So it true. Kind of scary. <laughs> yeah. But worth pointing out. Well, thank you so much for sharing that with us. And thank you for talking to me today. This has been really great. Oh, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. That's this week's episode. Thanks so much for joining me. And thanks to Todd Evans, not only for coming on the show, but also for putting me in touch with his sister and fellow poet, Rachel Mariano, and his brother, pianist Oren Evans, giving us a chance to see how growing up in the same family influenced three different artists. We'll hear from Rachel next time. If you enjoyed this episode, please do mention it to a friend. And don't forget to leave a review. It really helps new listeners find the show. Thanks so much. You can find show notes, the six creative beliefs that are screwing you up, and more at fycuriosity.com. 
I'd also love for you to join the conversation on Instagram. You'll find me at FYCuriosity. Follow Your Curiosity is produced by me, Nancy Norbeck, with music by Joseph McDay. If you like Follow Your Curiosity, please subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to tell your friends. It really helps me reach new listeners. See you next time.